Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. We are taping the morning after day two of the latest Trump Festival. I want, I want to start off before we get going. And by the way, we're, we're joined by uh, two of our favorite guests, uh, Stuart Stevens, of course, a longtime political guru, the author of the best selling book, It Was All a Lie, and Josh Crashauer from the National Journal. So, Stuart and Josh, thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. Okay, a little little bit of a little bit of literature and history. Okay, listen to this. Everything seems out of nature in this strange chaos of levity and ferocity, and of all sorts of crimes jumbled together with all sorts of follies. In viewing this monstrous tragic tragic comic scene, the most opposite passions necessarily succeed and sometimes mix with each other in the mind: alternate contempt and indignation, alternate tears and laughter, alternate scorn and horror. Edmund Burke. You knew it was 18th century, right, guys? He's talking about the French Revolution, but he really sums up the Trump era. And I thought this was kind of a a good way of introducing where we're at right here with 68 days to go until the election after watching the Trump Festival turning the White House into a prop, which is sort of almost like a side note now. So let's just dive into this, okay? Josh Crashauer, Stuart Stevens, is this working? And I, I want to start with you, Josh, because you, uh, your piece up in the National Journal uh, is headlined, Republican messaging shows that not all suburban voters are the same. The Trump campaign used diverse messengers to deliver red meat rhetoric to middle class suburbanites who backed the president in 2016. It appears to, it appeared to work on Monday night. Okay, Josh, you think this is working? How do you know it's working? Well, we'll see when we see the polling. But, you know, my political prism is, can the president recreate that 46% minority coalition that allowed him to win the election in 2016? He's lost a lot of ground with even his supporters, his, his reluctant supporters, four years ago. And, you know, Democrats, I thought, had a very good convention and, and getting folks like John Kasich, getting uh, a lot of a lot of moderates, avoiding sort of the culture wars may have been effective. But when I look at the election, and I look at the electorate, there's a left right ideological divide. And, and I think where jo- Joe Biden was effective is not, you know, letting the socialists run the show, so to speak, controlling the message. But there's a sort of a blind spot I also saw at the Democratic Convention, which is sort of the the upscale, downscale, the socioeconomic divide in the country where, you know, which was so apparent in the, in the last presidential election. And I saw Biden doing very well with sort of the upscale moderates, the John Kasich voters, the, the national security advisors that really gave a searing indictment to, to President Trump's foreign policy. But I didn't hear a lot of, of messaging or policy sort to those downscale, the working class moderate voters that had defected from the Democratic Party. And as I wrote last week, you know, Joe Biden's convention looked a lot like Hillary Clinton's convention, which mm. you know got great reviews at the time, but turned out to be sort of a political disaster. And every Democrat I talked to in the wake of the November 2016 election said that, that, that the fact that she didn't talk policy, she focused so much on Trump and his, his unique abnormal behavior was a big political mistake. And, you know, in the midterms, the Democrats didn't talk about anything but health care. They, they didn't talk about President Trump at all to win these these swing districts. So I think the the goal for the Republicans is was to kind of fill in the the, the, the empty empty spaces to make the case for why the voters that voted for for the president in 2016 should should reelect him again. That he's got his problems, but he's there to fight for you. That he's with you on the fundamental questions of the day. Um, you know, I think on the pandemic, I think they have they left a lot lacking. I think they need they, they didn't really address the top issue enough. In these first two days, but on issues of law and order and, and sort of the the, the 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 growing violence that's taking place in many big cities, the, the fact that Democrats didn't address that issue at all, and, and the Republicans have been driving a Mack mm-hmm. truck in, in, with that, you know, I, I think that okay. that has been a success story for, for okay. the Republicans. Okay, so Stuart Stevens, I'll ask you the same question: Is it working? We know what they're doing, but is it working? Look, I think it depends on what their goals are. Um, if their goal is to make Donald Trump feel better. And to sort of establish this political oligarchy that has continued to rule after Donald Trump wins or loses, um, and to prove that the Republican Party has no uh, principles because they won't stand up to Trump. Yeah, I think that's working. But if the goal is to uh, put together a coalition that is greater than the 46.1% that he won with in the first place, I don't think it's working. Um, 
politics is about addition, not subtraction. Uh, they, they seem to think that if people vote uh, with a lot of intensity, that one vote will count more. It doesn't. Because here, here, here's my question, because I, I'm, I'm, I'm watching how pundits are covering this and they're you know examining each speech and talking about who the target is and whether it will stick and whether it will move whether you're going to claw back some of those reluctant suburban republican you know conservatives who become disgusted with trump but are being reminded that they really hate liberals more but i guess the question i have and i i did my i wrote my newsletter about this the reality check who's actually watching all of this maybe you know 15 percent of the voters are watching all of this most of them are probably the hardcore uh, you know, partisans, you know, that's what Harry Anton said. And I, and I, and I kind of wonder whether or not a lot of the, the, the coverage of this is this, you know, is that we forget, you know, well, or maybe there's the incentive to inflate the importance of these events, even though we know they're going to be forgotten in a few days. And, and you know, and I, I think Stuart, the point you're making is there's a context here. This is not taking place in a vacuum. People have had three years to absorb Donald Trump. They have been inundated and saturated with Donald Trump. A lot of things are going to happen uh, you know, between now and the election. And I'm really trying to remember historically, and you guys are good at this, has there ever been a political convention that has fundamentally changed the trajectory of the race, that has altered the fundamentals of the race? Because we know what the fundamentals of this race have been. So why would we think this convention is any different? So I guess what I, I am suggesting, Josh, that, that perhaps we overanalyze things because we're all watching this. And because of the obligation of 24-7 punditry, we have to, you know, inflate the importance of all of this. But most of these targets are not watching. And even if they are watching, you know, there's no pivot. There's no new tone. We're just going to flip back to where we were. I mean, by Friday, you will have forgotten everything that happened last night and tonight. So, so I defer to Stewart on the history uh, of, of whether conventions have a, a major impact, given that he, he's been front and center in so many of them. My own, my own impression is that there's sort of a short-term bounce that, that, that parties get. You know, Sarah Palin certainly yeah. gave the Republicans juice in 2008 before all the, the negative revelations about her came out. So I, I think in the end, it turns out to be mostly a wash. But there is a bounce and a psychological bounce, maybe more importantly, that a party can get in the short term that can change, change the dynamic of a race. Um, you know, I think, you know, what Stuart was saying earlier is so spot on about that the pandemic is the number one issue, and it's going to be the issue that dominates the, the debates, dominates the rest of the campaign. And I was surprised, uh, like I said earlier, that the, you know, the Republicans haven't talked a whole lot about it. In fact, Larry Kudlow seemed to suggest in his remarks that the pandemic was behind us. Well, that's a lot of past tense. Not the case, but you know there is. A, I'm looking at looking at the latest polling. There is sort of a partisan divide on just how serious uh, and how how alarmed voters are about the pandemic. You know, there's sort of an emerging you know Republican and even some independents seem to think that look they they they're concerned about public health. It's a big issue for them, but they're not as alarmed to the point where they feel like schools need to be shut down. They're not as alarmed where they feel like businesses need to be, you know, the, the quote that Biden uh, said in his ABC News interview that he trusts the scientists, we need to shut it down if, if there's a, any kind of spread. You know, there's a lot of nuance in, 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 in the views of how yeah. we should do the pandemic. But, but sometime before the election, maybe a week or two weeks before the election, this country is going to hit the milestone, 200,000 Americans dead from the coronavirus. And so... I would just say that the, the, the politics, I think, are whether people think Trump caused the death. I mean, it, Trump was uniquely responsible for not saving lives or whether this was sort of inevitable and, and any any president would have had trouble. OK, so possible. Stuart, that, that's, I think, a political test. OK, Stuart. Uh, look, um, if I just woke you up in the middle of the night uh, a year ago, is that, you know, this Republican convention, it's going to happen when uh, the worst economy, more people out of work than any time in American history. Worse than the Depression. And uh, there'll be this new disease and more Americans will have died in the last five months than ever before in U.S. history. But Donald Trump wants to make this about crime. I think we probably say, I don't know. That's going to be tough. Um, I, I, I think, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's sort of the fundamental lesson of duck hunting. You know, aim the gun where the ducks are going to be. And where the ducks are going to be come fall, it's going to be all about school. It's going to be all about your kids in college coming home. It's going to be all about um, the fact that your school tried to have people, uh, students come back, and it lasted uh, 10 days. 
this can all this can be all about uh, you know no Ohio uh, State Michigan game. Um, there's a, a rhythm to American life uh, in the fall, and Donald Trump has taken that and you know shredded it uh, like one of his prenuptial agreements. Um, so uh, I, I, I think that this is going to be about what matters most to people in their daily lives. Everybody's talking about Wisconsin. I think one of the most interesting numbers, and Stuart, you will probably remember this, one of the most interesting numbers out of Wisconsin is that Donald Trump, in winning Wisconsin in 2016, got fewer votes than Mitt Romney got losing Wisconsin in 2012. In fact, Romney lost Wisconsin by a pretty substantial margin, I think seven points. And yet, even losing by seven points, he got more votes than Donald Trump got in 2016. So this issue of which electorate shows up, it, it's not a cliche in Wisconsin. I mean, it is literally Wisconsin will be determining which electorate shows up, the 2016 electorate or the 2012 electorate. OK, so I want to get into this. Uh, there are a lot of things going on. And, and I'm you know, this is another one of those days where we ought to spend some time talking about the violation of the Hatch Act and the the, you know, turning the White House into a prop and all of that stuff. I think that's kind of the noise that, you know, plays on MSNBC more than it plays for the, the, the swing voters. But I do know one issue that is playing in the minds of voters, in, at least in my state. This is the violence in Kenosha. We now have two dead. We have somebody else shot. We have the images of the fires. Um, this may spread. You know that the Trump campaign is weaponizing this. And um, I mean, Josh, first of all, I mean, this is from the point of view of the Trump campaign, this urban violence and things like Antifa, uh, they think might be the pivotal issue for them, don't they? Yeah, I, I've been talking to pollsters on both the Republican and Democratic side, folk, people who have done focus groups, including the Bulwark's own Sarah Longwell, who have found the issue of violent, violent crime, uh, rioting in, in, in major cities spiking in recent weeks is a major issue, not just for the most Trumpian voters, but independents and even some Democrats. Uh, there was a Pew Research poll that that showed, you know, among the voters who put violence in the cities as a major issue at rank number five and just behind the the pandemic. And you would never think that, but but that 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 was sort of a grim reality of where where we are right now. Uh, the fact that this is happening in Wisconsin is got to I mean, it's almost like the script writers of the 2020 election, you know, had some sick joke that they wanted to, to put into this crazy campaign because, look, Wisconsin is 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 that was the state that put Trump on the map. That was the state that, you know, this as better as better than anyone, Charlie. But like Wisconsin is a state where Trump's message resonated, uh, you know, more, more than anywhere else. And I guarantee you that that the images that we're, we're seeing from Kenosha last night are going to be put in a Trump campaign ad. It's not just going to appeal to the base. It's going to appeal to a lot of voters that may agree, that don't like Trump, that don't like his his per, his, his character, his way he's handled his conduct in office. But they're worried that the Democratic Party is sort of beholden to to the left wing to the point where they didn't even address the issue of violent crime of of of, of, of the rioting at all. I mean, and I and just to what just to just to wrap things up, like Trump, the, the Biden or any of the, his allies should have said Trump is the chaos candidate. He should have used Jeb Bush's line and, and, and made this issue his advantage. And the fact that they left a vacuum on such a, a pressing issue seems to be political malpractice to me. OK, Stuart. Um, look, uh, you know, there's, there's a season to these things. So we just had the convention season. We're having the convention season. Then we're going to have a debate season. Um, this reminds me very much of this. Uh, sort of big uh, hysteria over defund the police. So how did Biden end that? He said, I'm not for defunding the police. I don't think this is really a very difficult uh, goal to accomplish. And you, you shouldn't try to accomplish everything in a convention or you'll end up accomplishing nothing. Um, I think they established that this was about uh, the pandemic and about decency. They won't lose that race. Um, they have plenty of time. Uh, to do lots of law and order stuff, to go out and uh, say how much he stood uh, behind uh, a civil protest. They've got Martin Luther King on their side in the, his in the history of nonviolent protest. So, um, you know, I'm impressed with the Biden campaign. I think that they've run a, a very, very good campaign. I don't see any reason why they won't rise to this challenge. 
Well, yeah, I okay. You, you know, we 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 always talk about 1968, but but Stuart, let's talk about 1972, because a lot of the disturbances, including Kent State, took place in Richard Nixon's first term. That you know that that chaos occurred when he was the incumbent, and yet he managed to weaponize this to say, "Look at the left, look what they're doing, look how crazy they are," and he was reelected in 72. So I wonder if 72. Isn't the better analogy than 68 when it comes to law and order? Well, if you if you look at 72, um, I think that would be more applicable if Bernie Sanders was a nominee. I, I mean, McGovern was so out of the mainstream uh, or portrayed as so out of the mainstream. They weren't running a competent campaign. I mean, let's don't forget Thomas Eagleton. Um, and uh, when... He started uh, in the summer and started their convention. They were already way ahead. They had a huge monetary advantage. None of those things exist now. Um, the most dangerous period for a challenger versus an incumbent president is the first couple of months after you get the nomination. You're, you're most vulnerable. You have to raise money. You have to put together a campaign. Um, in that period this year, I think for the first time in modern politics, in fact, I know for the first time in modern politics, <coughs> excuse me, the incumbent went down and the challenger went up. So um, I, I think uh, it, it's not going to be like, I, I don't think 72, I don't think Joe Biden is uh, George McGovern. Well, this is plausible, but I will tell you, sitting here in Wisconsin, overwhelmingly the reaction that I'm getting is are the Democrats going to speak out against this? Are they going to push back? People are you know, watching these, Im these images of violence in places like Kenosha and Madison, Wisconsin. They are genuinely concerned about it. And yes, this is happening under Donald Trump's watch. But I guess, Josh, you know, the concern is that and, and I think, you know, what, what's 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 happening in Wisconsin is our governor was very, very slow. Tony Evers is uh, not the most charismatic, strong leader, was very, very slow in you know, condemning violence. He has now stepped up. He's now done that. He has declared a state of emergency, brought out the National Guard. But I got a call yesterday from a rather prominent uh, Democratic uh, strategist who said that he was really worried about this. He said this is kind of a disaster for this to be occurring in Wisconsin at this particular moment. And, and I don't know if you saw, and so other Democrats get it too. David Axelrod had a tweet. He said, look, the shooting of police the shooting by police of uh, Jacob Blake was egregious and adds to a righteous sense of moral outrage about these recurrent horrors. But make no mistake, arson and looting play right into Donald Trump's hands and the primal fear message we hear so frequently at this convention. So, um, yeah, you know, normally the those other fundamentals would would play. But among the voters in play in Wisconsin, this this is a challenge. Well, I mean, the, like, the, the bigger issue is why the Democrats felt that they didn't need to address the issue at all. I mean, I, like I said, I thought that was political malpractice. And there's a way to do it where you like like Stuart laid out right just just a few minutes ago. This is Trump's fault. That Trump is the chaos president. And you wouldn't be seeing this if you had stable and, and more competent leadership. They didn't say that. And I talked to a lot of Democrats who and I asked why, why couldn't you just kind of put that out there just to inoculate yourself? From these inevitable attacks and they said look biden may be moderate but but the left would raise holy hell because there's a faction of the party that actually believes the riots are acceptable and you see this mm. on the cable news they then i had you know i had senator uh, kamala harris's uh press secretary on my show on the podcast and i asked him about the rioting and whether that was an acceptable response and he didn't condemn it um and i was i wrote about it and was very very stunned by that so there's it's not just a small it's not just the bernie faction there's there's sort of a you know i'd say about a maybe a quarter of the democratic party that has a hard time just condemning unequivocally violence not not seeing it as an inevitable wow. product of of you know of you know they see it they see it as like a legitimate yeah. protest yeah. A legitimate reason, given all the, all the horrible racial injustices that have taken place, uh, starting with George Floyd over the summer. But that is not how voters see it. And that is going to be a big problem for them if they can't can't address it and, and do it in a more more pragmatic way. Let's do it. Look, I, I think this race, um, if if it's about one thing, which it's not, but let's say it's about one thing, it's about the non-white vote. So why was Trump able to win with 46.1 percent while Romney lost with 47.2? Um that was because uh, third party increase, but non-white vote declined for the first time in 20 years. So if I was working in the Biden campaign, um, I, I would say, look, this really isn't complicated. If we get non-white vote up 
to what it was. And it doesn't have to be 12. It uh, doesn't have to be 08. It could be 04 levels. We're going to win. Now, we may not win uh, in, in 45 states, but we're going to win this thing. And I think that we look at this and we tend to think how it's affecting or you know, asking these questions. How are white suburban voters? Uh, how are African-Americans looking at this? And it seems to me that another way to call these protests is get out the vote rallies. And I think if you had an election tomorrow, you, you would have historically high African-American turnout. And that is, a, is an absolute uh, death sentence for the Trump campaign. And I think one of the things that seems to be taking some people by surprise is that the uh, Republicans are not just folding. Um, you know, they're they're showing that they're going to be pushing back on on all of this. So, by the way, before we move on on this, I, uh, the uh, Biden campaign senior advisor, Simone Sanders, did issue this statement about the Kenosha violence. As Joe Biden said in the aftermath of George Floyd's horrific murder, protesting such brutality is right and necessary. It is an utterly American response, but burning down communities and needless destruction is not. Violence that endangered lives is not. Violence that guts and shudders businesses that serve the community is not. Now, that's a strong statement. Um, I guess the only thing that I would hold out for is I want to hear that from Joe Biden, uh, not just not just Simone Sanders. Just one other point, though, um, you know, Stuart, when we're talking about this and I, I think I told Josh this before we started uh, taping. Um, you know, it's not new that we live in these bubbles and these alternative reality silos, but I spent an hour yesterday watching, walking my dog, listening to one of the more prominent uh, shows on cable news, and they spent a great deal of time talking about what was happening in Kenosha. Not once did they mention the violence. And that's where I thought, you know, I understand how a lot of the cable stations have gotten into fan service um, and they think they know what they're doing, but they're not doing their audiences a favor and they're not doing the party a favor by insulating themselves from a reality that everybody else is seeing, not even addressing it. You need to know what's going on. You need to be able to confront it. You need to understand that this is a problem for you. But. I'm, a, you know, I was listening to this thinking, so if, if you're sitting in the Biden campaign, you're going, well, the base doesn't even know this is an issue. Why would I even speak speak about this? So I, I, I think that there's a um, uh, there's a there's a there's a, a failure on the part of some folks to, I don't know, open the window to all of the things that are happening and might be factors in this election. I'm just going to throw that out to you guys. Well, there's a divide in the Democratic Party, and Joe Biden won the nomination, and he's he's got the right instincts on these issues. I, I, I am, you're right, Charlie. He needs to give a speech. He needs to to say something more prominently rather than hide behind a spokesman putting out a, a statement. Um, the one thing I was sort of struck by was I don't know if you guys saw that ABC News interview uh, with both Biden and Harris, and uh, both Robin Roberts and and David Moyer. It, it asked both of them about these issues, and I was struck by. Biden being on sort of one side of this debate, I think he said there needs to be more police. We need to hold bad policemen accountable, striking a moderate message. And Harris sort of rejecting her past, you know, her past record as a prosecutor and really kind of taking up the the, the, the Black Lives Matter mantle. That, that, that they weren't on, the, rhetorically, they really weren't on the same page. And that's sort of the problem here. Democrats are trying to kind of thread that needle without really taking any principled positions on, on an issue that seems to be rising as a priority for voters. And they've got to get on the same page and they've got to be reading from the same hymnal because this is a vulnerability that they're going to need to have to inoculate them. Well, I, I don't know if I agree with Josh on that. I, I think that there's a different role historically for a vice president to play um, than a presidential candidate. Um, Agnew played a different role than Nixon. Uh, Agnew was an attack dog. Um, again, if it's all about non-white votes uh, and the intensity of the turnout and the level of turnout, um, I'm not sure they have to be saying exactly the same thing. I don't think they can say contradictory uh, positions, can't have contradictory positions, but emphasis, nuance. Um, I think they can be different and they should be different. They're very different people. I mean, Joe Biden is, a, you know, a 70, whatever, eight, nine white guy. Uh, Senator Harris um, is the first African-American woman. So that that doesn't really bother me. Does anyone care in the real world um, about what the president did last night, turning the White House into a prop? 
basically hijacking some of the most solemn, you know, presidential actions like the presidential pardon and a naturalization ceremony for political purposes. I ask that because, you know, it, it, in, in, on Earth 2.0, a frequent theme on this program, um, th- this, this would be, there would be blowback, but it seems like just sort of one of the details of this, that in the midst of the pandemic and the joblessness and everything else, that this is the kind of thing that insiders uh, worry about. But in some ways it was, it was so arrogant the way that, 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 uh, the president is basically saying, I will use every, every perk, every privilege, every taxpayer funded benefit, uh, all the trappings of this office to get reelected. And I mean, it was it was it was quite a statement. It was a statement that, you know, screw the norms, screw the traditions, even even screw that the, the Hatch Act. This is what I'm going to do. Is does it does anybody care about that? I mean, you know, we're we pundits are all like, oh, this is awful. This is terrible. And it is terrible. But do voters see it that way or do they go? Oh, cool. President White House. Do we know? Well, corruption is sort of baked into the the Trump presidency, you know, and I think from a just strictly a political point of view, uh, it doesn't matter. Yes. But the people who care about that are already going to be voting. Okay, I I think I'm looking at this picture. I'm looking at this picture of Pam, Pam Bondi, um, who is was brought out to talk about corruption. She was a corrupt former attorney general in Florida. But the, the the great moment was when she's talking about nepotism and the screenshot shows that she's she's speaking right before Tiffany Trump, Eric Trump and Melania Trump. And it's just like irony has just been killed. They won't do this, but I would uh, light a candle uh, to celebrate if after uh, Biden Harris win this thing, uh, the chairman of the Democratic National Committee announced that the next year's Democratic uh yearly meeting will be held in the White House. Just go ahead and do it. And what just absolutely crushes my soul is all these Republicans I work for, they lied to me. They said they believed in their oath of office. Here you have a president of the United States who's violating the law. You have a secretary of state who's violating the law. And, and this isn't uh, just a, you know, a victimless uh, violation. Uh, there are people who will work their entire lives to pay taxes that went into uh, the Treasury to pay for Donald Trump, Melania Trump, for, for Secretary Pompeo to do these things. That's, that's who's doing it. Who's paying for Pompeo's hotel room, Pompeo's hotel room? Um, it's not coming out of his own pocket. Uh, so um, it's, it's criminal. So we used to say that uh, character counts, role models matter. Um, I don't know a coach, a teacher, a parent that wouldn't say, okay, look, I'm going to break the law, but look, guys, you really shouldn't, okay? I mean, it's working for me, but, you know, that's not how we operate. That's not what a civil society does. And, and these are gangsters, and you can't blame Trump for being a gangster. He's been a gangster all his life. But what you have is the normalization of gangster government with the Republican Party. And I think this is going to haunt them for a long time. Do they really not think that Democrats are going to win? It's it's absolutely shameful, and I think it's terrible politics. These laws exist for a reason. They are not just norms and conventions and traditions. There's reasons why we have tried to draw a line between the White House and the the role of the Secretary of State in partisan political politics. Um, you know, the weaponization of the power of the government to the service of one political party has always been a danger. It's always been something that people have tried to avoid because it is so anti-democratic, but also just on a more fundamental level. You know, the White House is not Donald Trump's house. It is paid for by the taxpayers. You know, Mike Pompeo is on a taxpayer funded trip staying you know, in a hotel where the, the taxpayers are paying for all of this stuff. And it is it, it is it, the the naturalization ceremonies are not political props. They are fundamentally American institutions. By the way, Pompeo, the reason why secretaries of state have never spoken at a convention is because at least up until now, it was so important for them to represent the United States of America, not a political faction in the United States of America. So these are not just minor norms and insignificant or arbitrary laws. They, they really do represent something important. But again, I 
I'm, I'm not going to say that there's going to be a, a voter backlash against it because, as Josh points out, a lot of this stuff is just baked in. Well, and I will add something else, which is that in 2016, there was a lot of thinking in Republican circles that, look, Trump may be abnormal. He may be trying to blow up the establishment, blow up Washington. But there are the the wise men, the Jim Mattises, the, you know, the John Kellys of the world that are going to guide him and, and lead him to the, sort of the political bent and governing best practices. And maybe you could have made that argument to some extent in the first couple of years of the Trump presidency when those folks were in power, where they did have the ability to check some of his worst excesses, worst, worst tendencies. Uh, I think what, what we're, Trump has utterly lost sort of the suburban, you know, the John Kasich voter and a lot of, a lot of more moderate Republicans is th- those norms, those checks have been blowing up with more frequency in these last you know months, if not, not last year, you have a lot of inept, you know, bureaucratic, you know, you know, the fact that you don't even have an, you know, a working de- de- Department of Homeland Security secretary, you have these, these flunkies that are representing the administration and, and, and advertising their, their incompetence on a, on a routine basis. And, and, and especially with the pan- pandemic, you know, the politics come before mm-hmm. for the, the public health. Look, I, I, Trump has always benefited from the inability to imagine Donald Trump. So this is really how he got the nomination. Those 15 other Republican candidates couldn't imagine a guy uh, who was a maxed out donor to Anthony Weiner, who was a failed casino owner, who talked in public about having sex with his daughter, would be the Republican nominee. So then a lot of people thought that he would lose. The Republicans did, and we just have to rebuild. Well, then he didn't. So if anybody thinks that Donald Trump is going to ask permission to break the law, raise his hand, mother may I, it's childish. Trump will do what he's going to do, and he will do anything to stay in office. I think the period that we're entering is the most dangerous period in uh, American democracy since the Civil War. And I'm the most anti-conspiracy theory guy out there. But we've never had a president like Donald Trump. So here, let me just try this on you real quick. So November 1st, Donald Trump is losing. There's reports of voter irregularity in Dade County. I mean, there always are. He gets Chad Wolf to send whoever those guys are in camouflage into the Dade County Courthouse to seize the boxes. First of all, who's going to stop them? The, the sheriff? The, the Dade County security guard? I don't think so. Then they're going to have the boxes. So then the courts will go crazy telling them to return the boxes. But some of those boxes have been open now. And you have a chain of custody issue. So what are you going to do? You're going to throw out Dade County? You're going to revote? This is the sort of chaos, uh, as, as, as Josh referenced, that Trump is going to try to do. He will never lose a legitimate election. So we are going to have, win or lose, the first time President of the United States is delegitimizing democracy. And why that doesn't like trouble these Republicans, because what he's saying is that each of you was elected illegally, because vote by mail, most of them wouldn't be in office if it wasn't for vote by mail at some point. They won an election because of that. So they're all just a bunch of gangsters too. That's what Trump thinks. Um, and Do we think Bob Barr would stop him? I mean, really? You think Chad Wolf would say no? The only hope that we have, because Republicans are going to do nothing, is a fear that some of these people uh, have that they will suffer consequences in a criminal sense after the election. And I hope, I doubt the Democrats will do this, but I hope that they start uh, an investigation into the White House that goes through who were the advanced people who set this up, who gave the orders to break the law, who broke the law, and go right down. And they ought to be uh, they ought to be charged. And it will be the best warning that we shouldn't allow this to happen. Because if we just wink and a nod, it's going to happen again. Well, you know, and let me just underline why I I, I think they probably will be quote unquote too magnanimous, but. Understand, and I, I've kind of freaked people out by mentioning this. Uh, you know, the, the Trumps are not going away, even if they, even if he's defeated, which is not a certainty. Donald Trump could run in four years, and which Republican would run against him and, and beat him, unless, of course, he's in jail or facing all these other legal problems. Now, you mentioned how many years Republicans and conservatives have talked about character, which is still mind blowing to me because actually on my bookshelf I'm looking over here at all these books by Bill Bennett. Um, about the importance of character and virtue and all of all of that. One of the it won't, wasn't the only decisive moment, but was certainly an, an inflection point in 2016. And Trump thought it was an inflection point was when Jerry Falwell Jr. 
um, basically started the rally of evangelical Christians behind Donald Trump. I mean, you know, Trump himself has said, you know, Jerry Falwell was absolutely crucial to my campaign. He's the guy that basically broke the dam or he opened the door. Or I don't know what, I, what he said. And, and Trump is right. Uh, Jerry Falwell Jr. played a significant role in this transformation of evangelical Christians from a movement that cared about things like virtue and character to going, hey, we're OK with Donald Trump as long as he does what we want. So I don't know what, whether we can add anything to this, but how amazing it is that we are watching the whole, you know, Falwell, the lesser pool boy case. I, I just I mean, it, it won't have any effect on the election, but it's 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 really it is one of these morality plays of the era, isn't it, Josh? It's all about hypocrisy and, and, and people not living up to their, their stated values. It, it's, a, it's a gross story. And it's one I, I, I feel bad for the Liberty University students who yeah. you know, are trying to get a good education infused with Christ, evangelical Christian values. And they have the leader doing such egregiously corrupt and, 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 and awful things in, in, in the public eye. So, I mean, there's going to be more to come, Charlie. There's going to be more revelations from uh the, the, the pool boy <laughs> that that uh, was part of the, their their life, um, but it's it's just a gross story. I don't think it has a huge political impact, but but you know it, it goes to show that Trumpism corrupts. And Jerry Falwell Jr. was one of the first evangelical leaders to jump on that Trump train, and this is what he was doing, you know, in his personal life. Well, speaking of the students of, of Liberty University, um, we're we're learning today that uh, he's going to be walking out of that job with a ten ten and a half million dollar payout, um, and of and of course. Being Jerry Falwell Jr., he had, you know, when he confirmed his resignation, he had to invoke Martin Luther King Jr. free at last. So he went out as tastelessly as he has presided over the university. But I'm just trying to imagine being a student who's struggling to pay tuition at that school and realizing that that so much of that money is going to be going into uh, into, into Jerry's pockets. Uh, you're, you're right. We have not heard the last of that story. And it is sort of interesting, just the the world around all of this, this sort of miasma of, of, of corruption. Uh, we didn't even get done wallowing in the Bannon uh, in, in indictment before the pool boy story broke. And then, of course, there's Eric Trump speaking at the convention. But a couple of days after we find out that he's pleading the Fifth Amendment in an ongoing criminal investigation. And you know that this is going to keep unfolding one way or another. Josh Crashauer and Stuart Stevens, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. I always appreciate it. And thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We'll be back tomorrow and we will do this all over again. There are now 68 days to go before the election.